I'll just briefly want to just say um, a few words about uh, Derek Mahan's tone, a kind of positional tone, and his also his range. I think it's important um, when we look at the lives of lyric poets, we, we just think of them of, as having a few little orphans of books, as um, somebody once called it. Um, none of Derek Mann's books or collections are in any way sort of awkward orphans, although he, he himself in print has attacked his own first book. Um, but Mike Longley, interestingly enough, describes him as a bird of paradise from Glen Gormley, a very unusual and unexpected thing. Um, a poet of surprising colour and energy. And I think um, man has both colour and energy. And it's the energy that I think is really interesting about, about him. Because reading his work over and over, and you don't have to read it over and over because there will always be some new work soon to look at. But what distinguishes him, I think, is he really operates out of a very high voltage in terms of writing. Uh, I mean that both technically and philosophically. He's a very high voltage writer. The work, the expressions, the phrasing, the ideas that come to the phrases, the phrases as they are arranged, often in threes, um, which is the best form of arrangement we know philosophically. Um, it's very considered. His work is a very considered kind of making. And it is not surprising that even he himself might admit it now and again. I think his great ancestors and his only deserving ancestors in the modern era would be Louis MacNeese and, and W. H. Auden. In fact, there is a definite MacNeesian quality in the thought of, of man, um, which is both a quality that is infused with kind of classical, not so much references as rhythms or learned and earned poetic rhythms that come from other lyric traditions, particularly Latin lyric tradition. And that's very much part of the charge which is in his poetry. Another essential part of the charge, technically, in Mahan's poetry is the way he can enjam a line directly, quickly, in order to create an unexpected rhyme scheme. And that is such a gift which is Magnesian and to some extent Auden-esque. But it's very much a defining kind of characteristic and a, a formal character in the work of Derek Mahan. And that has a prodigious effect on those who wish to write poetry. Um, because just as really poor poets will really discourage you from wanting to write well, really brilliant poets will make you really want to write. And Mahan, reading Mahan, has that effect. And I will never forget the effect that Mahan's book, Courtyards in Delft from Gallery Books, 1981, I'll never forget the technical effect it had on both myself and on Sean Dunn, the poet. In fact, I don't think Sean Dunn, either technically or philosophically, would have been able to arrange himself if he hadn't encountered Courtyards in Delft by Derek Mann. Suddenly, Sean Dunn found a vessel within which the wine he was creating could be formed and held together. And indeed, Sean Dunn went on then to, to write another kind of formality, which has become a distinctive mark of, of Mahan's work, which was also in Auden and indeed in MacNeese, which is the letter, the long verse letter addressed um, usually to fellow poets or to other poets. Um, so you can see that even technically, you can see the influences and effects which are entirely beneficial and organic and positive. And this is the organic effect of really good poetry as it works on you when you're a reader who wishes also to write poetry. As for the, the, the philosophical area, one of the extraordinary things about Derek Mahan is 
his astonishing range, which in fact, this is one book you have to own if you wish to be a writer, if you wish to be a poet. It's called Echo's Grove, and it's translations from various authors. Um, the, the number, the, vari the variety, Baudelaire, Ibsen, and Nerval, I mean, just amazing variety, even Petrarch, going back to Petrarch, Rambo, all of these, uh, and of course the great classical poets, um, which again is part of, I suppose, W.B. Stanford's influence on the whole generation of Irish poetry, with the teaching of classics at Trinity College in the early 60s, late 50s, early 60s. Um, I don't think if, if any work has been specifically written on this matter yet, but definitely that particular Trinity teaching tradition had a profound aesthetic <coughs> effect on the Finnish in a whole range of Irish poetry. And it's there in Mahan's poems, but book after book. Um, you could say that the work of Derek Mahan falls naturally, if you like, into three kind of waves of prodigious talent and prodigious production. There are books like Night Crossing, The Snow Party, The Hunt by Night. You could say by 1982 he was at the end of, of really his first great phase as a poet and had exhausted the possibilities of those anthologies of both ideas and journeys. And then I think there was that incredible second phase in his work was, which was the formalising in a Magnesian way of his own life experiences, including the deteriorations in his personal life, in his social life, his exile, not only, if you like, from family, from Ireland, but in a sense, an exile from a previous possible self, which comes across in wonderful letter poems, the Yaddo letter, the Hudson letter, and the Yellow Book. All of these are incredibly important works, and would, um, as sort of instructions on how to be a writer, on how, in how to be a poet, if you like, in how to create a feeling for poetry through a poetry of feeling. These poems are just absolutely fantastic. The Hudson Letter, for example, part two out there, begins. Here I was sitting quietly in my studio and grading papers with the radio low, as Pascal says we should. When out of the blue last night, under the fire escape, some psycho sends up a stream of picturesque abuse directed evidently at my fourth floor window. His reasoning trenchant, complex and abstruse. One of those paranoids who seem to know the systems out to get them even so. For paranoia, of course, is no excuse. So that's just the opening gambit. Um, see how he assembles a number of attitudes and he's making you share those attitudes so that he centres you in a particular way. He gives you an attitude by which he now will have you sitting there in that attitude with your elbow in that way to the poem and then he continues with his description knowing he's got you. That's how deliberate it is. That's how dramatic and how fine the writing is. It's very like, in many ways, similar to the kind of method of attention grabbing that you find in the prose of Elizabeth Bowen, for example. You know, I've often quoted it before, Elizabeth Bowen's fantastic description of Mrs. Veermont coming into the room. Mrs. Veermont, a very heavy woman, and she sits on the wicker chair, and the wicker chair discusses her briefly before settling. <laughs> so this is also the way Derek Mann sees reality, the reality by which he will actually focus the lens for you in order that you will hear his arguments as he outlines them. His later phase, I think, which is almost, in many ways, an event within Gallery Press, as well as an event, in a sense, within Derek Mann, are these great books, Harbour Lights, Life on Earth, and this wonderful book, An Autumn Wind. Um, these are just poems and collections of poetry of the highest order. And as I say, they not just carry the poet to us, they almost carry a publishing possibility into a new era of Irish poetry. And I think that's really what he has done, and that's what his main achievement. Sometimes it is a kind of symbiotic thing 
between the act of editing, publishing, and the actual <coughs> preliminary act of writing. And when the two suddenly work together, what you get are kind of a sublime music of published materials. And An Autumn Wind is one such book. Just to remind you, Under the Volcano, page 51 of this book, An Autumn Wind. The heat seekers of Cork have been coming here to Lanzarote year after solar year in the high season to sit on balconies and bob like cork in the subtropical seas. A cruise ship bound for Europe shimmers past far out, its music system going full blast to join October in the temperate zones. It's hereabouts, said Plato in Timaeus, the lost Atlantis lies, and Hesperides retain their charm even in these dark days. The golden apples of the sun, of course, are the great draw, and the rich local wines uncorked as a red African disc swoons into the western sea. The charcoal black volcanic sand, the cactus thick and coarse in the dry scrub beyond the beaten track, makes this a different kind of destination. MacNeese <laughs> chose Iceland for his holiday stuff, as if he couldn't get enough, as if he couldn't get north enough. But the Cork crowd, weary of fog and rain, can fly directly to this part of Spain. So there he's giving us a geography lesson, a social lesson, and also a lesson in rhyming. Um, and that's part of his magnificent achievement. So as I say, it is that tone and that range that is so important. If I were to recommend uh, a recent book of his to, to buy, I would say, An Autumn Wind, a magnificent book, and I would say a companion, um, which is a kind of conversational companion, Red Sails, uh, uh, which is a, a collection of prose. And his prose is magnificent because it's very considered. He's a highly educated man. Um, and he, I won't say he wears his education lightly. He wears it deliberately so that you might wear it lightly. It's a very interesting thing that he does with his references. Um, he can casually bring in a classical reference, a French reference, um, an American reference, a, a reference for fiction, the name of a book, the name of an author, and casually slide away from it. It doesn't interfere with the narrative that he's creating as a poet, but now he's giving you something else to pick up out of the beach that is his own work. I first read Montaigne properly when an auditor libre at the Sorbonne in the autumn of 64, I squeezed into a packed lecture room to hear about 16th century prose. Space was disastrously limited in those days, so I soon skived off and hung out at the Cinematique, at George Whitman's Mistral bookshop, and in obvious pit stops like the Café de la Sorbonne and Eau de Par, at least getting to talk to French students. On the Rue des Ecoles, there was, and still is, a life-size bronze statue of the old boy, in a seated, thinking posture, doublet and hose, knees polished by many hands. So we became acquainted, and now he's back in fashion. Why? His materialism, his relativism, his colonic preoccupation, yes, but especially his materialism. Pascal was one of the first to take him to task for this, and complained too of the essays in form and style. Montaigne, he felt, went on too much about trivia, petite histoire, and talked too much about himself. As so often in these cases, the critique was provoked in part by horrified fascination. It was, after all, Pascal <coughs> who first said of the natural style that you expect to read an author and you find a man. This is the opening of another essay. But that's it. It's just the tone and the mastery of tone and the mastery of a single story, all put together in prodigious books. Thank you.